Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 20, starting with, uh, starting with verse 26. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. What does it require of you to be a servant? The first thing I would like us to take a look at is that if you're really going to be a a servant, and and by the way, I asked Richard to teach this class uh, because I believe Richard is a servant. Uh, Richard has served a lot of us here in all kinds of different ways. He's really good at it. But one thing, if you're going to be a servant of God, is, is that you have to be ready for some kind of sacrifice. There's something. It could be time. It could be money. It could be your personal well-being. There's there's something that's going to be asked of you that there's going to be a sacrifice if you're willing to be a servant. So that means that the, the easy road, the easy path to take would be to say, I don't want to be a servant. I don't want to do that. A lot of times the easy road what I told my kids, by the way, a long time ago. A lot, of times the, a lot of times the easy road is not the best road. And that many times the hard road is the best road. So there probably will be some kind of sacrifice asked of us if we decide to be the kind of servant that God wants us to be. Being a servant does not come naturally. I mean, there's some people, especially here at Palm Beach Lakes, there's some people that are just really, really, really good at being a servant. And there's things that go on behind the scenes that we don't, we don't hear about. And there's some things behind the scenes that, that I, I hear about, but there's some things that nobody hears about. So there's people that have dedicated themselves to, the, to this action of being a servant, of this position of being God's servant. But yet it doesn't come naturally. What kind of servant are you when you're born? Not very good, right? When somebody's little, what has to happen? Yeah, they have, they, somebody has to take care of them. Somebody has to serve them. They're not, they're, not, they're not qualified to be a servant because somebody has to serve them. So it doesn't come naturally. Someone has to be taught to be a servant. You have to have some kind of of, uh, of teaching, of scriptural knowledge. Christianity is a taught religion. You know, you're not, you're not born a, a Christian. Um, you know, your children at home might, might be Christians, might not be Christians, but they, they were taught that way to be a Christian. So it doesn't come naturally. It has to be grown inside of you to become a servant. And it's a lifelong process. You know, you're not going to you sit there and, well, I'm 50 years old... <laughs> Okay, I'm older than 50 years old. You know, I, I'm, I'm older than 50 years old, and, and so I've reached this pinnacle of being a, being a servant. It's not like that at all. You have to keep on growing and developing this, uh, the spirituality about you that allows you to be a servant. And you have to allow yourself to be a servant. You, know, you have to be able to, to, make, to make that choice. We're going to talk about choices later. The word servant <clears throat> comes from the, the, the same word, the Greek word that we get the word deacon from, doulos, and it appears 125 times in the New Testament. There's a, there's a danger that I want to I tell you about. There's a danger, and that is this. Sometimes we get this... Uh, this feeling or this action that you look 
at other people being servants. And, and, and we, have, we have people that are visible, don't we? Dan and David are up front almost every Sunday and Wednesday. We have people that are, that are very visible. And we know that we have, uh, you know, we have a truckload of deacons here. What do we have, 20 deacons, I think? We have, we have 20 deacons. And so the danger is, is that we become complacent in being a servant because we think the other person's going to do it. Here at Palm Beach Lakes, we have 20 deacons. We have 20 special servants. They're going to do it. Uh, we have enough Bible class teachers. I see them coming up and down that hallway all the time. They're going to do it. See, that, that's dangerous because, uh, because it's wrong. It's wrong. Has God put a limit on servants? I only want this many servants. I don't want any more. Not at all, has he? So we should never, ever, ever get the idea, you know, well, that Dan's, a, Dan's an evangelist and David's an evangelist and so they're taking care of the evangelist part of all this. I don't have to be the evangelist part of that. That's wrong, isn't it? That's a wrong attitude. We all should have that evangelistic spirit. We should all want to be able to teach others the gospel of Christ and not lay you know, that on the evangelist's shoulders. That's not scriptural at all, is it? Not scriptural at all. So being a servant is not natural. Being a servant is a choice. Turn, if you will, to uh, 2 Timothy. We're going to take a look at 2 Timothy chapter, or chapter 2, verse 24. Oh, uh, you know, you know me. I like I like discussion. It's really hard in your auditorium class. I know I like discussion, y'all, because because uh, you know I talk all day, and I have little kids that talk. They talk back to me. So your your silence is is uh, it's troublesome. No, I'm just kidding. All right, chapter two, verse twenty four and twenty five. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that may, they may know the truth. If you're going to be a servant of God, the first thing that we have to think of is not to be quarrelsome. Have you been around a quarrelsome person? Now, I'm not talking about somebody that's had a bad day. But I, t- I tell you, there's, there's people, that for some, I'm not sure their personality is a quarrelsome personality. They want to find a fight anywhere. Uh, you could be doing anything. I see some smiles and laughs in the audience. I hope you're not thinking of, uh, you know, your spouse or something. But, uh, you know, they want, they want to pick on something. And so they be, they're a quarrelsome person. A quarrelsome person would, that being quarrelsome would be a big hindrance to being a good servant. It says, the scripture says that a servant has to be gentle. A gentle, a gentle spirit. A gentle person. Think in your mind, uh, think of your mind right now of someone that you think of as really a servant. Think of somebody right, just one person, in your mind right now, one person that you think of as as God's servant. This person is a servant. This person is a servant's servant. That person. And tell me right now, in your mind, is that person quarrelsome? Is that person gentle? See how these characteristics fit? They fit, don't they? If you really, really put a name to this, and you think of these characteristics of a servant, it, it fits. It talks about being able to teach. And then it, this is talking about doc, doctoral issues, isn't it? There's, there's going to be times in our life, if, if, if we're actually living our faith out, if so people to see, 
if we're actually talking about God to others, of course there's going to be times when we're going to have to talk about doctrine. There's going to be people that have different doctrinal thoughts, different teachings that they've, they've had inside of them, some of them for years and years and years. And we, as God's people, sometimes are put in a position where we have to be able to defend the truth as servants of God. And patience. A servant of God has to be patient. I don't think patience is a natural thing. I think there's some people that are very patient. Have, do you know somebody that's not very patient? My, you, ever, you know, uh, I say this sometimes as a teacher. My patience is going up to here. So they, they, I guess the students know if the patient factor goes up to here, that's dangerous. So if pa- you know, the, the, pati- the patience factor is right here, that's okay. But up here, no, no, no. I'm usually a patient person, I, I believe. But I, but I was taught that. My dad, and I, I, lo- I love doing this, though, but my dad made me put together models. Uh, it, well, he didn't make me, but he bought me models and said, I want you to put together this model. And the, one of the reasons, for the, probably the key reason, was to teach me patience. Because I wasn't very good at building things, and I'm still not, you know. I'm not like a Dirk Summerlot that can take a toothpick and build a boat out of it, you know. So I'm not like that at all. So he, t- he, he taught me patience. Something, if you have young children, it's something to think about. Patience as, as something that's taught. And if you're going to be a servant, God expects us to be a patient servant. Humble. We, we shouldn't have any kind of haughty thought about ourselves and, and full of pride. A prideful person isn't going to be a very good servant. A prideful person probably won't be a servant. And if they are a servant, they're, they're a prideful person probably being a servant for their own good and not the good of others. Now I want you to look above verse 24. In my Bible, there's, it's not a chapter heading, but it's, it's, it's a division. It's right above verse 14. Anybody have a division right above verse 14? Jerry, what, what does yours say? Unashamed workman. An unashamed workman. Mine says approved and disapproved workers. It doesn't say it's not workers. It says that it's approved and disapproved workers. Isn't that something? It could have said those that are being a servant, workers for God, and those aren't. That's not what it says. And if you do look at the verses above 23, look at it. There's, there's uh, all kinds of uh, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. That's in verse 15. Shun profane and idle babblings, verse 16. Uh, uh, look, look down. Verse 21, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. There's something about being pure in heart, being pure in your actions, that creates a good servant. God uses a clean vessel. God uses us as servants uh, with, with the purity of heart. Look in uh, Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. 
For even Christ did not please himself, but as it was written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. When we want to be a servant, the thing to get out of us, our, our entire being, is that I'm doing this servant servitude for me. Because it's not about me. Uh, it's about the other person, isn't it? So if I'm going to be a servant for God, I have to get this, this being, I'm going to do this for me, out. God doesn't approve that. Uh, sir, you know, the action might be good. Somebody, has, somebody serves somebody in, in a good way, but what are the motives? You know, what are the motives behind that? Is, is the servant getting something out of that? Um, some kind of uh, reward right away or, or maybe some kind of prideful feeling. So, there's something, something there that's not right. God doesn't approve that. So when you serve someone, it has to be for that person and for God, of course, because what we do unto someone else, you know, we're doing it to God. So we have to make sure that it's for the other person. All right, so I've laid this out. You know, uh, I laid this out saying all these things, but not really giving you a tool or basis for this. And this is the basis. And that is, we have to, to join these two things. We have to join wisdom with being a servant. And that's what tonight's class is all about. Using wisdom and being a servant. Go ahead and turn to the book of Proverbs. If you take a look at the way at the beginning, verse uh, chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs, of course, is a book of wisdom, isn't it? Inside the book of wisdom, Proverbs talks about wisdom. Let's see what it says. I have some verses highlighted to take a look, uh, for us to take a look at. Look at verse 2. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. Verse 3. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. Go to chapter 2, verse 2. So that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Right now, how important is wisdom? It's growing, isn't it? Being wise is growing right now. Verse 7. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. Chapter 2, verse 10. When wisdom enters your heart, and knowledge is pleasant to your soul. Chapter 3, verse 13. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. Verse 21. My son, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Chapter 5. Verse 1, my son, may attention to my wisdom, oh, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding. 8.11. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things one may desire cannot be compared with her. 
Chapter 9, verse 10. 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. 10.13, wisdom is found on the lips of him who has understanding, but a rod is for the back of him who is devoid of understanding. How important is wisdom now? Hopefully it has come to the forefront of your mind and your heart. Making wise decisions will make you a very wise servant. And that's what God wants. God wants to use that wise person as a servant. He wants to be able to, he wants to, be able to use you as a person that makes the right and correct choices. Wisdom is found 37 times in the book of Proverbs. It comes from uh, the book, uh, it comes from the Greek, uh, Hebrew word Sophia. Common meaning means ability to apply knowledge to please God. Knowledge, intelligence, skillful use of reason. That's wisdom. We have, we have 20 deacons. We expect them to use wisdom, don't we? And the decisions that they make. We have five elders. We expect the five elders to use wisdom. Isn't that in many people's prayers? They pray for the elders and they say, Please, we ask to be with them that may make wise decisions. And everybody else, hopefully. We should pray for everybody else that they make wise decisions. And that they can be the best servants that God wants them to be. And sometimes it's hard. When I was little, probably like most of the people here, not the wisest person in the world, I had a best friend named Chris. Chris, he would get me in trouble. We had this big dog uh, named Cindy. The other dog was named Nate. No, I'm just kidding. We had this big dog named Cindy. She was part Airedale. She was very hairy. This happened a long, a long time ago, but Chris and I decided to give Cindy a haircut. And I, I have no idea why, but in all our wisdom, we decided to do it in my mom and dad's bedroom. <laughs> and that's, what I, that's what I remember. And so we got scissors... This isn't the only thing we did that poor dog either, but <laughs> we got scissors and we cut the hair off of her. So we had all this hair. And so uh, we decided to, uh, to, to, I was like, we've got to get rid of this hair because my mom's going to be really mad, you know. So knowing that my mom was in the kitchen or the living room, we couldn't just come out, you know, with all this hair in our hands, so we had to get rid of it. So what else would you do? We put it underneath my mom's bed thinking that that would take care of the situation. So we leave the room, and my dog comes out looking like uh, a wreck, you know, uh, hair cut all over and patchy and everything. And of course, my mom saw that. Well, I don't know why we didn't think she would see the dog. <laughs> she saw that and was like, what happened to Cindy? What did you do? And we were like, well, we gave her a haircut, you know, because that's what you do to dogs. You give dogs haircuts, I guess. And so, uh, so she said, where's all the hair? I, I, I was, had to be honest, and I said, it's underneath your bed, Mom. That didn't go very well. So she said, you have to get that hair out. So we got a broom, and we got all hair out. So we have all this massive amount of dog hair, and the wisdom does not stop there, because... My, and I'm just going to blame my friend Chris because I don't want to blame myself, I guess, because I don't know who had this really decision, but I put, we put the hair in the toilet. <laughs> and we've, we tried to flush the toilet. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. So th th it didn't flush, of course, and it all came bubbling up and, and had this big mess. So now we have 
a, a running, overflowing toilet with, with hair all over the bathroom floor. That's actually the last thing I remember. I don't, can't remember anything. <laughs> I can't remember anything after that. So that was a good example of not being wise. Turn to the book of James. Look in James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. In your imagination, do you think you see our elders sitting in the room and beginning of their meeting uh, in prayer? Do you see that? Do you see them asking for wisdom? If you do, you're absolutely correct. We ask for wisdom. Uh, Hopefully everybody does. So, characteristics of true wisdom. First, first it comes to, it comes from above. Dirk, isn't that on your email? True wisdom comes from above? Yeah. You probably wrote it a long time ago. It's on Dirk's email. When Dirk sends you an email, it's right there on the bottom. True wisdom comes from above. That, that, that's the first thing to remember. Second thing. True wisdom is pure. It's not going to lead you astray. It's not going to lead you down to putting dog hair in a toilet, that's for sure. It's not, going to, it's not going to lead you into being incorrect or sinful. It's pure. True wisdom is peaceable. If you go back to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the peacemaker. True wisdom is gentle. It's, it's full of fairness. Being wise means you have to weigh things out sometimes. You have to make wise decisions. I'm sure the, the school teachers in here can agree with me. Uh, we make those decisions of who did what to who and, and so on and so forth all, all the time. We have to make quick, snappy, wise judgments uh, and hopefully we're correct at the end of the day. But we, uh, hopefully we try to be fair. We have, to be, we have to be willing to suffer a wrong for what is right. True wisdom is full of mercy and good fruits. If you're still in the book of James, look at verse 13. I'm sorry, go to chapter 5, verse 13. Chapter 5, verse 13. That's not what I want either. But anyway, full of mercy and good fruits. I have no idea why I wrote that down. I was thinking of something else. Number seven, true wisdom is not double-minded. What does it mean to be double-minded? I know my brain has two hemispheres. One is probably working, the other one's not. Double, double-minded. Hypocritical. Hypocritical, and that's going to be our next point. Character, characteristic of true wisdom, not a hypocrite. Turn to Matthew chapter 21. Maybe you know someone, they, they're, they're, they, they say something and their actions are different. They say something and their actions are different. They say something and their actions are different. That's not wisdom at all. That's, that's being unwise, isn't it? Chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to uh, Beth, Bethphage, Beth, Bethage? Bethage, and at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with with her. Loose them and bring them to me. If anyone says to anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them immediately. That really does not go with what I was trying to find. All right. I 
I'm not sure why that was in there. But let's talk about being a hypocrite. What was Jesus' attitude toward being a hypocrite? Vipers and thieves. thieves. Who did he address and said, you are a hypocrite? Pharisees. Pharisees, yeah. He looked at the Pharisees and said, that's, and of course, you know, he's, he's deity. He can look into their minds and their hearts and say, you are hypocrites. A hypocrite is somebody who says one thing and then turns around and does something else. Their actions don't follow with what they say they are doing. A hypocrite is condemned scripturally by Jesus. A hypocrite is condemned by God. If you think of yourself as a servant, you can't be a hypocritical servant. It's not acceptable to our God. We have to be a, be a person that has integrity. Sometimes uh, I write notes to our teens uh, via Facebook. We have a special senior high Facebook spot. And sometimes when I write something, at the end of it I say, live a life full of love, peace, and integrity. That's a way to conduct your life, isn't it? Love, peace, and integrity. Being a person of integrity means that you're trying to, you're best to do what's right. I'm not saying you won't flop, stumble. But a person of integrity would not ever be called a hypocrite. They're opposite. A hypocrite is somebody that is really trying to have a life of deception, right? To deceive somebody, say one thing, and then turn around and do something else. It's being a hypocrite. Jesus condemned it. Serving with wisdom involves the act of choice. Plain and simple. If you're going to be a servant of God, you have to get wisdom. We can find wisdom first in the Word of God, right? That should be our primary direction is toward the Word of God. That's where I'm going to find wisdom. I'm also going to find wisdom in mature Christians. I'm going to find wisdom in somebody that knows something, right? Somebody that has led a life. Uh, Probably not going to go to a five-year-old and ask for wisdom. Probably not. But I could go to a mature Christian and ask for wisdom. Our primary direction toward, should be toward God's words. All right, I have some, uh, to end up this evening, I have some thought-provoking questions. I should write that down, thought-provoking questions. It, it, comes, it comes from a curriculum. All right, now, if I ask a question and you stand there and look at me, we're not doing anything except looking at each other. So please... See if you can answer these questions. Here we go. Number one. What are some ways in which you can serve the Lord daily? Daily basis. That can get a little rough there. How can I serve the Lord daily? And that could happen on a daily basis. That was good. Dirk or Gwen? Any other ways? Gwen, did you have something? 
So, so, no? Okay. So your hand went. All right. Anybody else? How can you serve the Lord daily? like that. Yeah. All right, question 2. Why should service not depend on what others say or think about it? Well, let me say that again. That's kind of wordy. Why should service not depend on what others say or think about it? We haven't talked about agape love. Thanks for bringing that up. That's right. Agape love is, 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 is it's a regardless love. I'm going to love you regardless of whatever. All right. Yeah. See, see how Nicole connected wisdom with... Again, uh, a 4.0, Nicole. All right. I was going to say A, but that's not... A, all right. Number three... How can serving others help us be better people? How can serving others help us be better people? See, I told you, thought-provoking questions. I wasn't lying. What was the other thing? Okay. <laughs> How can serving others help us be better people? Okay, well, when you help someone or aid or service someone and no one don't know nothing about it but you and God, he rewards you openly. So if you know that, you'll be happy to help someone because, you know, All right. Does our, will our actions here follow us up to heaven? Absolutely. God knows when a sparrow falls. God knows when you give a child a drink of water. Our actions here will follow us up to heaven. Yeah. It's the action. There you go. Question four. Why are some essential characteristics... Sorry, what? It's a what question. What are some essential characteristics one needs in order to serve with wisdom? Essential characteristics. Humble. Humble. That was one of them. I listed them. See, it's a test to see if you're listening. Meekness. Patience. Patience. Wisdom. See, it's the people up front here. I don't know. <laughs> Willingness to do it. Yeah, yeah that comes from humbleness, doesn't it? Not, not having pride. Uh, question five. What are some ways in which God is glorified and Christ is exalted in our serving others? What are some ways in which God is glorified and Christ is exalted in our serving others? And, and that's not in a showy way either. I mean, that's just, that's just you doing something and, and it's, it's by chance that somebody or maybe by providence somebody is seeing you do something, right? So it's, it's not in a showy way at all. 
So uh, in our actions, we glorify God and we glorify Christ. Thank you very much.